go into a dive at, you know, 15,000 feet and you, re you release and you pull out, you, you gray out, you can't see. In the beginning, it was a little hairy, but after a while, you, it, was, it was routine. Dive bombing was a piece of cake. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. My name is Jonathan DeSola Mendes. I was born in New York City at Lenox Hill Hospital, November 3rd, 1920. It was a Sunday morning. I was a senior at Dartmouth College. My roommate and I listened on the radio. We heard the attack. We knew our college days were over. And shortly thereafter, the Navy came recruiting for pilot training, and I signed up together with 35 other classmates and undergraduates. I never thought about it. I never thought about flying, but I said to myself, why not? And interesting enough, I flunked the eye exam. And uh, my mother had taught me, if at first you don't succeed, you try, try again. So I went to the Army Air Corps and I flunked their eye exam. And I went to the civilian pilot training and I flunked their eye exam. And I went back to the Navy and I flunked their exam again. And the recruiter said to me, get yourself a case of carrot juice and a bottle of vitamin A pills, take it for a month and then come to Boston and we'll examine you there. I followed his advice I went to Boston, I passed, and it changed my whole life because I became a naval aviator flying for the Marine Corps. Well, you started in a canvas-covered canvas -covered biplane, open cockpit, you know, called the Yellow Peril. And then you, you advanced to more powerful uh, aircraft training planes uh, until you uh, got your wings. And once you got your wings, I was assigned to dive bomber training, so I went to, a, to school to learn to be a dive bomber, where you go into a dive at, you know, 15,000 feet, and you, re you release at 2,000 feet, and you pull out, you, you gray out, you can't see, but you're conscious and you pull out and then gradually your sight returns again. In the beginning, it was a little hairy, but after a while, you, it, was, it was routine. Dive bombing was a piece of cake. Well, I was assigned to this squadron, VMSB 151. I arrived in an advanced group, six uh, or eight planes of our 24 plane squadron to Anjibi Island in Anawitak Atoll. I was there uh, 10 days after the ground marines had taken and secured the uh, island. And uh, they had tents set, set up for us and foxholes. And the Japanese came back the next night after I landed and they had a big bombing attack and the bomb landed so close to my foxhole that the coconut logs and the coral flew up in the air, but my head was lower, I didn't get hurt. And the next morning I saw this tremendous bomb crater nearby, but every one you walk away from is a good one. I had no idea what war would be like. I had no background to, to even appraise it. And uh, I, I was never fearful, and I handled it well. And, you know, I, I did whatever they told me to do. I flew every mission, and most of the times they had me lead. I, was a, I would lead missions rather than be a follower. Well, I came back. And the first thing they did was to send me to Quantico to, to learn to be a Marine, to get Marine training. 
you know, after a year in combat, then you go to school to learn to be a Marine and how to shoot a rifle and march with precision. And after that, then they sent me to the West Coast where I flew first in a, a SB-2C dive bomber squadron, then a torpedo squadron, and then the best thing of all, twin engine night fighters, which is the hottest thing the Air Force or the Navy and the Marine Corps had. It was a fast plane with two big engines, and I was flying that when the war ended. Well, there was, there was one weekend a month, you'd go to Floyd Bennett Field, and you'd fly two or three missions, you know, pre-planned missions, to stay current. So when the Korean War came along, we had two Marine squadrons there. The other squadron got immediately called up, and we were called up a year later. <clears throat> well, when I got called back, almost everyone in my reserve squadron got assigned to a combat squadron and carrier duty, and I was a major, and they sent me to the training squadron, you know, to give refresher training and uh, ch uh, checkouts uh, in the jet, uh, transition training. And I, I, I was not happy with being an instructor instead of getting to a squadron. And I complained, and they said, well, if you don't like it a month from now, come back and we'll change it. Well, I got to fly jets before anybody else, and I was training, I was flying it every day. I got more jet time than anybody in the Marine Corps. And John Glenn and Ted Williams came through, and I took Ted, I didn't want anything to happen to him, and I gave him his first five rides in the jet. And John Glenn hadn't accomplished anything important yet, so I never even paid any attention to him. He's just another regular. And then later on, both of us, both of them were in the same squadron with me in Korea, and uh, we flew missions together. And uh, Glenn was just an outstanding human being and terribly aggressive. And one day he came home with a hole in his tail fin, size of a basketball. And he wasn't happy just dropping his bombs. He'd hang around and he'd strafe the target until he expended all his 20 millimeter cannon fire. Uh, Ted Williams, and the other, he was my wingman on his 39th and last mission. And on his 40th mission, he taxied out and taxied back saying he had fire warning lights on in the cockpit, you know. Well, and no one else ever had fire warning lights, and he'd done this before, and we realized that his heart was not in it, as simple as that. And a few days later, they sent him home on a medical discharge. But he flew 39 missions, Glenn flew 50 missions, and then went to the Air Force to fly their, their fighters, and he shot down three MiGs before the end of the war. As a pilot, he couldn't have been better, but also as a human being. He's one of the finest individuals I've ever met. You know, he had the right stuff. And when he talked to you, he made you feel you were important. He did. He had, that, he had a genius for leadership. I spoke to him on the phone six months before he passed on, and then I kept in touch with Annie. Yeah. But uh, he, he's the finest individual I've ever met. Williams? Well, he was his own person. He could have gotten out of, he had enough political clout 
not to be called back, but he didn't use it. But after being called back and sent to Korea, his heart was not in the flying. Just wasn't there. Because he was my wingman on quite a few missions, missions because I was a senior pilot and we wanted to didn't make sure nothing happened to him. Well, I was a senior pilot. I was a operations officer of my squadron in charge of flying. So I always got to lead the important missions. And it was a mission of 24 planes, 12 from my squadron, 12 from another squadron. And I briefed them, you know, from the takeoff point, how long it would take to get to the target and how to fly it and how to return it at return. And uh, the weather wasn't too good and we flew over the overcast and it, when I thought it was right, I let the flight down through the overcast and fortunately located the field. And we, we all dropped our four 500 pound bombs and we, I took 24 planes out. I brought 24 back. And you know, these missions would get so routine and there were no surprises anymore. Yeah, you know, just remember, you know, I, I did 70 missions. Anytime there was, you know, a special mission or a difficult thing, send John Mendes. You know, they send me out there. One night, they needed a decoy for the night fighters to practice. So they sent me out for the night fighters to locate me, and I'm out of sight of landing. And if they lost me on radar, I'd go swimming. But they didn't. But one day, one night, a night fighter didn't return. And the next day, I led a, a search, an eight-plane search over the ocean to see if he had parachuted or landed in the water. But we never found him. When I came back from Korea, I was, met a beautiful young lady, and I said, maybe this is it. And she was an artist from the Art Students League, and she painted it in Provincetown in the summertime. And I drove her up to Provincetown in my station wagon with her canvases and her eagles, easel. And then I borrowed a Corsair from World War II Corsair. I was flying jets at the time where well, you couldn't get a jet plane in a little civilian field. So I fired the course here, and I filed a flight plan for the Air Force Base, but I missed it, and I landed in Providence on the civilian field and folded the wings and left it all weekend. You know, I, I did this three weekends in a row, and the third weekend, Saturday morning, I said to her, what do you think about the idea of getting married? And she said, oh, I don't know. She said, well, I'll ask you again sometime. And then she said, what did I say? Of course, let's go tell my parents. <laughs> and that's how I proposed to her. I'm proud of that I spent 30 years in the Marine Corps Reserve doing everything they asked me do, to do as best I could, and as far as I'm concerned, generally quite successful. And I accomplished all the missions they asked me to lead, and I walked away without getting hurt. I hope you don't mind me pointing out that you are 101 years old. What do you think is responsible for your longevity? Well, I can't say it's drinking scotch every night. That's not it. But setting goals and doing everything you can to obtain it and knowing when, knowing when you've exhausted and stop. But you have to set the goals. 
at 46, I started running around the reservoir every morning before breakfast, once or twice. <clears throat> and I've been in the Central Park every morning, generally weather permitting. So I've, and I've done 16 New York marathons. I'm the third oldest marathoner in the whole world. You know, <laughs> that not staggers me, it amuses me. Yeah, well, that's a real claim to fame. Yeah, and that and the token will get you on the subway.